So the last of our talks today uh, is not being presented by a student per se, but is uh, about a, um, a program that is highly relevant to, um, to students who are into free and open source software, the Google Summer of Code. And it's being presented by the coordinator for, of the Google Summer of Code from the Google Open Source Programs Office, uh, Carol Smith. Please make her welcome. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I, um, if any of you are familiar with the Google Summer of Code program, I'm actually... Um, my predecessor's name was Leslie Hawthorne, as uh, was mentioned earlier, and so I am I am the new Google Summer of Co Co Code coordinator. Um, I've been in the Open Source Programs Office about a year now um, at Google. Um, I've actually been at Google about five and a half years, but I moved into the OSPO uh, in March of last year. So I am. I, this is this is only my second Summer of Code. Um, so anyway, uh, how many of you have heard of the Summer of Code program? Wow, that's awesome. I love this place so much. You guys are great. <laughs> um, I, I go into rooms in other places, and you know nobody raises a hand. And I, I feel I, I, it's it's so heartwarming that you guys know know about this program. Um, so I will. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Summer of Code because um, I'm sure there's probably some people in the room at least who aren't familiar with it. Um, but then I'll sort of uh, give you some interesting, tasty stats and stuff, and some information about the program this year because uh, just yesterday we announced that we are in fact running the program for 2011 which is uh, great and um, so we can talk about about the program for this year. Um, so what is GSOC? Uh, GSOC is a program that encourages students to work in open source software essentially. It's an online global program um, and students are paid a stipend over the winter <laughs> Uh, to work on a project for an op open source organization. Uh, Google, at the beginning of the summer, chooses, um, uh, last year it was 150 organizations, we choose or open source organizations that we partner with who provide mentors for students to work on a project over the summertime. And um, students are given, uh, it, they, uh, it, it's very much like, a, like submitting a, a regular proposal for a, a college course. You submit a proposal at the start of the summer, um, winter, <laughs> um, and the mentoring organization will cho choose the proposals they, they want to mentor, and then students are given a midterm and a final evaluation, um, and in exchange they're, they're given a stipend for, for the work that they're doing. Um, and hopefully um, what basically happens here is, um, and what, what we like to encourage is that the students get uh, involved in the open source community and, uh, and and start to work more and more with the open source community even outside of the of the project and the program. Um, and so we're trying to encourage more students to work in open source software and become uh, regular contributors to the project that they that they worked with. Um, I, I've heard a lot of students say um, that they were already working in open source and isn't it great that they could get paid to do a project they would have done for free anyway. Um, and that's that's awesome. Um, so uh, I kind of went over a lot, a lot of this already, but uh, basically we are getting more open source code into the world, which is a great thing, and we're getting more students introduced to open source software in general. And oh, by the way, uh, students are getting paid to work on these projects, so that's all awesome. Um, uh, does anybody know about sort of the history of Summer of Code? I can, I can talk about that a little. Um, so. This was actually Larry Page's idea. Um, he decided, um, I, I don't know if all of you, I'm sure all of you know this, but all of the servers in all of the world <laughs> that are running Google are running a Linux distribution right now. And so Larry Page decided uh, we should start giving back to our open source compatriots and getting more students involved in open source and thought, thought that was kind of the genesis of the program, um, giving students something to do over the summertime. Um, a lot of students get college credit, uh, university credit for, for working, participating in this program as well. So in addition to, to getting uh, paid for it, they also, also get college credit, which is great. Um, and uh, we also uh, try to, we also uh, give um, back to the organizations as well in the form of giving them a stipend for uh, each student that they mentor as well. Um, so not only do these organizations get, um, get more pr code produced for them, hopefully they get new developers into their community, um, and we also uh, give them some money for, for the hard, hard work that they do mentoring these students. Um, it is not an easy job being a mentoring organization for Google Summer of Code. Uh, it's a very time and, and in energy intensive process and it's really a labor of love. So, 
Um, so uh, we announced uh, GSOC 2011 just yesterday, and um, these are some important dates for you. Uh, starting on February 28th, we're going to be accepting applications for mentoring organizations. Um, in years previous, we've only had a week for mentoring organizations to apply. This year, we're giving everyone two weeks. Um, I got some feedback that people would have liked a little bit more time, so uh, we're extending that a little longer this year. Um, so they have until March 11th to apply. Um, another thing that um, we're trying to do this year is encourage um, smaller open source organizations who maybe are not quite as established in, in the community as our larger you know, Apache Software Foundation, Python, Python Software Foundation, um, to, to, try to apply as well. Um, we're trying to get more new interesting um, organizations to participate in Summer of Code this year. And so um, we're, we're kind of uh, floating the idea around of trying to get smaller organizations that have just started in the open source uh, community to also participate in GSOC this year um, and see if they can get some benefit from, from GSOC as well. Um, so then and on March 14th, uh, so in the interim time between March 11th and March 14th, hopefully students are talking to their mentor potential mentoring organizations about project proposals that they'd like to do. Um, and then starting on March 14th, uh, students can start applying. Oh, sorry, sorry. March 14th is when we review applications. March 18th, we announce organizations. Between March 18th and March 28th, uh, hopefully students are talking to their potential mentoring organizations about uh, what projects they'd like to work on. And then starting March 28th uh, is when the applications op uh, open for student project proposals. And that will also be a, a two-week deadline. Um, March, uh, sorry, April 25th is when we announce accepted students. And um, between April 25th and May 23rd, we have what's called the community bonding period, um, which is essentially a, about a month of time when students get to um, basically talk to their organizations about their project in, in more detail, get familiar with the code base um, if, if they're not already, um, and sort of get, a, get more uh, integrated with the community before they actually have to start working on the project. Um, we've also gotten feedback that some students don't actually get out of school until till either early May or, or, or mid-May, and so this is actually helpful for them to not actually have to be trying to go to school and working on a GSOC project at the same time. Um, and then uh, May 23rd is basically when coding actually officially starts. Uh, oh, that looks like it cut off at the bottom there. Sorry about that. Um, uh, July 15th, we have midterm evaluations for all the students. Uh, August 26th, final evaluations. Um, and we announced that following week uh, what our pass rate was. Um, I won't go into too much detail since I've already talked about this, but basically the students are paid. Um, you're given $500 as a student for being accepted into the program, and then if you successfully complete your midterm evaluation, you're given uh, $2,250, and if you successfully complete your final evaluation, you're given $2,250. So. Um, wide range of projects. Um, obviously, um, we had 150 organizations last year from across the board. Um, we have large umbrella organizations, like I mentioned, like the Apache Software Foundation, who kind of um, have students, uh, GSOC students who work on projects for them, and then they provide sort of th this umbrella organization for other smaller organizations um, to participate in GSOC um, who might not have been accepted already. And then we also have uh, other organizations, like um, for, we had a Dreamwith and um, a, a whole uh, Sisters was participated last year, a whole wide range of um, open source projects. Um, I think this is kind of obvious, uh, but uh, sometimes it's hard to convince students why they should participate. Um, but uh, hopefully getting involved in an in a, uh, open source community over the summer, if that's not enough <laughs> of an incentive, um, you also get uh, real world experience working with an organization and committing code and getting feedback on your code and actually working on a project, um, etiquette on a mailing list, um, which uh, some some people are actually not familiar with, and, and this can be very helpful. Um, and you get a stipend, and you get to work online in your PJs um, on your project, which is pretty awesome. Um, so it's a it's a pretty pretty uh, good deal, I think. <laughs> then again, maybe my opinion is biased since I run the program. Um, so these are some cool stats for you, tasty statistics. Um, 2005, we had 400 students, um, which uh, in 2009 we had 1,000 students. Um, I have, I have 2010 on the next slide, so don't worry about that. Um, uh, we went from 40 organizations to 150 in 2009. Um, 
and uh, we had an 85% success rate in 2009. And uh, so this is actually an interesting, uh, more interesting pie chart than you might think. So um, this is a breakdown of countries um, that participated in, in uh, that were accepted students uh, for Summer of Code. So that, that green uh, one is the, the US, the purple one is India. Um, but this one is actually the one, uh, this green one over here is a really interesting one. Uh, Sri Lanka actually came up on the list this year in, in the top 10 of countries participating. So um, I think they are the country to watch here. Like um, I, I, was, I was pretty amazed and I think that's awesome that um, they have a big open source effort in Sri Lanka right now. Um, this big blue blob over here is basically all the other countries that are not in the top 10. Um, but uh, these, uh, this basically the, the right half of that pie chart is, is uh, the top six countries that participated. Um, you, unfortunately, you can't see the very bottom of this. Uh, we had uh, uh, over 3,400 students submit over 5,500 proposals, of which um, we accepted 1,026 in 2010. And um, we had 150 organizations, uh, 69 countries. Um, of represented by students. We actually had pro slightly more than that represented by mentors, um, but that's just students. And an 89% success rate, which was our best year yet, which is also awesome. And um, some useful links for you since uh, we announced the program and we'd like you to spread the word. I, I hereby deem you all people who should spread the word. Um, Google Melange is where we administer the whole program from. It's uh, actually an open source, um, it's its own, own open source effort that was created specifically to run the Summer of Code program um, and there are a whole bunch of student developers who, who work on this pro project. Um, FAQs, it's a very long link, but if you go to Google Melange, it's, it's linked off of there, so you can check that out as well. Um, we have a discussion list that has suddenly gotten very popular in the last couple days since we announced the program, so you might want to subscribe to that if you're interested in talking to people. And uh, we also have an IRC channel on Freenode as well. So, thank you for your attention. Questions? Please wait for the microphone. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the graph that you showed showed that the, uh, uh, yeah, the one before that, that you yep. had a, a drop in 2009. Was that a conscious sort of reduction for management purposes? Uh, yeah, so my understanding is that in 2008 we kind of decided to, to build the program up a little bit and in 2009 it, we, it kind of became clear that kind of the magic number was 1,000 students. Um, it sounded like 11, 1125 was, was a, a little bit unwieldy. Um, and so yeah, we purposefully dropped it back down just a little bit um, to, to make it a little easier to administer. Uh, what's what's kind of the biggest limitation? Uh, uh, the, the fact that there's only one of me, right. <laughs> um, and and um, we I only have so much time in the day. Um, it, it, we might actually um, we might actually be accepting more students than a thousand this year, uh, depending on on the quality of the proposals. Um, but that that will all depend. Um, but yeah, it's it's mostly a limitation of time and energy and, and effort. Uh, and, and have the projects all been software related or have there been some that have uh, been like hardware? And actually, we had two open source hardware organizations participate this uh, in 2010, one of which was BeagleBoard and the other of which I'm blanking on the name of. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> I'm sorry? Was it Arduino? No, it wasn't. Um, somebody else. Uh, BeagleBoard and somebody else. Um, the, the list is on, uh, forgive yeah. me. Cool. Um, but yes, we did have two hard, open source hardware organizations participate this year. I, I was just curious, um, what do you base your success rate on? Or you on the number of students who pass their final evaluation. Uh, so if you if you don't pass your midterm, you're out of the program, obviously. And then um, all the the students who pass their midterms go on to the final. And then of the students who pass the final, that's how we that's how we figure out our success rate. Your success rate seems to be getting better. You had 82, 82, mm -hmm. 80, 83, 85, and the last one's 89. 89. Uh, can I ask why why it gets better? What, yeah, what have you I, learned? I yep. think there's a few reasons. Um, one is I think that the organizations over time have gotten a better understanding of how to choose the really strong proposals at the start of the year. Um, and a lot, that we've gotten a lot of tribal knowledge about how to recognize a student proposal that might not be as, as uh, might not have as good a potential for success early on. Um, and the other is I think the organizations have gotten really good at um, 
sort of heading off problems of the past that uh, if, if they have a student who's kind of on the border at, at the midterm and they pass them, um, there's a lot of uh, more steps that the organizations have figured out that they can take to, to actually make, a make sure a student is successful on their project overall. Anyone else? Hi. Yeah, given that it's not actually our summer, Yep. And there's going to be heaps of other things we're going to be doing in that time. What sort of time contribution is necessary? Uh, do you mean as an organization or as a student? As a student. Um, so we generally advise students to treat this as a full-time job. Um, and that if they have something else big going on in their life, that it's probably a, not a good idea to participate, try and participate in Summer of Code as well. Um, having said that, um, only only each individual student can make the decision on how they, how they want to divide their time and, it, and if they think that it's possible. And it's, it's also up to them to discuss their time commitments with the mentor and the organization and say, I have this other thing going on or I, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm trying to work a part-time job. Can I also do Summer of Code? And you have to decide with the organization. Um, but our general rule of thumb is that you should, you should assume that you're going to be working on this 40 hours a week. For how long? Four months? Was uh, three, uh, three months. So it goes, um, uh, where's my timeline? Yeah. Um, so basically from April 25th until um, end of August. So, uh, this could be a problem for a lot of Australian students though, considering around April going on May, you're heading into the real deep hours of study mm -hmm. near your exam period. Uh, I, I don't have a solution to that problem. I think each, each individual student needs to decide whether or not that they think that they, they can handle the time commitment. Would it perhaps be um, an interesting idea to uh, split up your summer of code into two periods, one based on the uh, um, northern hemisphere and one for the southern hemisphere. That way it can actually be an Australian summer of code. Yeah, um, uh, unfortunately I don't have the time or resources to run two summer of code programs. Um, so what, what we've done now is, is just this last year we ran the Google Code In program during our winter, your summer. Um, but it's not intended for university students, so there's limitations of that. But we are now running two programs, uh, uh, basically, in the winter and the summer, regardless of what hemisphere you're in. Um, so that, that's, that's the solution we've come up with thus far. Um, I, go ahead. Also, yeah. I'd like to uh, the oh, microphone. <laughs> it's still a great project, though. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, was that just a comment on the... Yes. <laughs> it's all right. Another gating factor is that um, it's very labor intensive for the projects and the mentors. And while we've raised the issue of doing multiple periods throughout the year with our mentoring orgs, um, I think two programs a year is about as much as they can do. So. Yeah, and we actually uh, this year got. Uh, we only had 20 organizations who participated in Google Code In, and um, we got a lot of feedback that even that, even having done that right off of the tail of, of Summer of Code, was incredibly time and and, and resource intensive, um, and it was hard to handle even doing that. So. Um, I would, I would, uh, I, I heard just yesterday about um, GNOME running a program intended specifically for Southern Hemisphere students. Um, it was, I think it was intended as a, as an outreach to women in open source software, but um, there are other organizations doing the, these kinds of things for, and I would welcome more organizations to do more Summer of Code type programs that, that are more conducive to the Southern Hemisphere if that's, if that's what you guys would like. Have you actually noticed, I mean, like, what has the participation difference been between like the North and Southern Hemisphere? Has actually, this actually affected? Actually, Kat has an answer to that. <laughs> I have run the numbers and um, Australia comes in 20th in terms of overall participation over the last, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, uh, six years. 
So, and I mean, obviously there's all kinds of great talent down here. And so thank you for making the extra effort. <laughs> um, in terms of northern versus southern hemisphere participation, it is looking at it in terms of number of students relative to the overall population of northern versus southern hemisphere. The numbers are a little bit less relative to the population, but not as much as you would expect. Um, I don't know if that's because some of the countries in the southern hemisphere are on the same school calendar as the northern hemisphere. Um, if you have any insight as to how that happens, because frankly, I expected it to be disappointing, and I was pleasantly surprised. Uh, yeah, um, I, I mean the title of the program is Summer of Code, so, so we typically do it in our summer. Um, but but, the, but that's, that's only for the U.S. Uh, is that? Uh, it is. It is a global program. We have students from all over the world who participate. Well, the reason why I ask is my son was interested in doing this. Mm -hmm. um, he's just left year 12 now. Yeah. And you know, being having a father of, of, as a geek, obviously I was encouraged, but I did look into it. And the amount of time he has and the time it's on makes it totally impractical for him. Mm -hmm. Whilst if you did it over Christmas, which, yes, I realise it's called Summer of Code, and you can only do one a year, but why not do one that's more accessible worldwide? Um, well, the answer is because right now the program that we're running over Christmas is Google Coding which is our, our sister program to Summer of Code, um, which is for 13 to 18 year olds. Um, so I, so uh, we're, we're running two programs for, for everyone between 13 and 100, trying to get everybody involved in open source software all year long, so. <laughs> Um, I, again, I, 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 the only answer I have to that is I have limitations of my time and effort, and our mentoring organizations have limitations of their time and effort. And so, run, even running one summer of code every year is incredibly difficult, is incredibly time-consuming and and resource-intensive. Um, thank you for saying that, so I didn't have to. <laughs> um, what's the pass rate between the two hemispheres? Uh, I have I have no idea. I, I have never crunched that number. Yeah, I have never crunched that number. Um, sorry, in the uh, American summer, um, but if there were any Australians that were accepted into the um, program, to just allow them to start at a different date. Um, yeah, we've actually, um, I've had a lot of discussions about, about the, the date and the timeline thing specifically. Um, even, even lots of uh, countries in the, in the Northern Hemisphere feel like April is too early to start the program. Um, they want it to start in, in June or whatever. Um, unfortunately, again, it comes back to an issue of time and resources. I can only, I can only so basically this, this becomes a question of I have to issue payment cards for the students and then we have to pay them on a particular schedule based on when their midterms and their finals are. And if we have students on a rolling calendar who are, who are constantly starting and, and having midterms at different times, um, basically I, I fall over and go insane. So clearly we need a second year. <laughs> Uh, I agree. <laughs> Actually, that's all the time we've got for questions right at the moment, but I, I imagine some people may be speaking to you afterwards. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, thank Carol, you. for that talk. Um, thank you. I want, I want one second thing. Um, if you asked a question, um, can you come up and see me afterward? Thank you. Uh, open day as well? Are you running uh, yeah, a store? We'll have, a, we'll have a booth at open day, and, um, and we'll have swag and stuff as well, and Kat's giving a talk, I think, on what is open source, and it'll be awesome, so hooray. Mm. So come on down. Okay, so before.